<laughs> um, um, I guess a, well, for anyone who is still working on it, um, on the, the last problem, one of the formulas for standard deviation, um, Um, oh, thank you for including the handout with the. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we're all. What? She said. She said. She said I'm a <laughs> Okay, just making sure I copied it down right. Um, okay. So. Um, So continuing with direct methods, gas elimination and all that good stuff. Um, detailed roundup error analysis of gas elimination, which was transcribed from all the crap that Gene Gall did on the board, and so I can't be confident that it's even all correct. Um, and judging from past experience, if I actually go and cover it in full, not only will we fall behind, but by the end of the class, you'll all have blood coming out of your ears. It'll be that painful to try to digest. Um, but I do want to cover like the essential points uh, from it. Um, okay, so, um, because the oxygen elimination had, I mean, it's something that we all take for granted in the, from the moment you learn it in linear algebra class, it's one of those things, one of those techniques you do like differentiation and integration, but, and it seems like something that's really firmly established, but that's, that hasn't always been true, um, especially once these problems are being solved in computers, um, people believe that maybe gas elimination wasn't meant to be used on computers. Maybe it wasn't really stable and that because, you know, even back then they were aware, aware, <coughs> aware of round-off error, um, that uh, maybe the accumulation of round-off error from all the operations ah, sorry, um, would be so great or could be so great that you couldn't even trust your answer. So there was a belief long time ago, and back in the 60s, that perhaps Gaussian elimination was not stable, uh, when not numerically stable. Um, so uh, Jim Wilkinson, uh, who is uh, one of the biggest pioneers in numerical linear algebra, um, decided to do a very careful error analysis to see how round-off error could accumulate through the whole process. And he established that, no, Gaussian elimination actually is uh, Stable. Okay. Um, so uh, the way you confirm this is um, you try to take into account the round off error, error that can happen during uh, every operation, because what's happening is in solving AX equals B, but doing so in a way that incurs round off error. Um, produces a solution that is, is not x. I'll call it x hat. That's an approximation of x. Um, and of course, we want to know like how far off could x hat be from x. And the way we do that is we use what's called backward error analysis. And um, what that means is x hat, instead of thinking of it as the approximate solution of our exact problem, it is the exact solution of an approximate problem. So it's the exact solution of what we call a 
nearby problem um, that I'll describe as um, A plus delta A, so that's like a perturbed matrix. And then X plus delta X. I'm not sure why Gene used lowercase delta as something else, but he did, so I will too. Um, so this is our X hat. Um, and then we have a perturbed right hand side too. Um, oh, actually. In this simplified version, I'm going to use the true B. So we'll at least assume that B is exact. Um, and uh, the analysis would largely be the same if we um, included perturbation in B as well. Okay. Um, now, so the, the idea is. Um, We, we need to get a handle on the, these perturbations. So, well, this is the perturbation we really want. If we can figure out how big this perturbation is, then that will help us get a handle on how big this error is. So that's what that's what backward error analysis is. You estimate the error you care about by estimating the error you can actually get a handle on. All right. Now. Um, so how do we do that? We keep in mind what are the stages of solving AX equals B. So we um, compute the LU factorization of Gaussian elimination. Um, so, but it's a nearby, it's a, we get these factors, which I'll call L bar and U bar. So these are the LU factors we actually compute instead of the exact LU factorization of A. Therefore, these are the exact LU factors of a perturbed matrix. So this E accounts for round off error. Um, and then we do for substitution. Um, so we have our exact right-hand side, but we're working with a perturbed matrix, L plus delta, okay, L bar, so and then we have our, so y is the exact solution, but we're not getting at either. We get some approximate solution, y plus delta y. And then we do back substitution. Um, so we have, so whatever matrix u bar we got out of this, we're solving using added back substitution, but even then, only approximately. Um, equals um, whatever we got out of here goes here. Okay, so at every stage of a process, round off error is incurred. Um, and we account for that error by saying, okay, what, whatever is our output is the exact solution of a perturbed problem. So that backward error analysis assumption is made in every step. Okay. Um, so here's what we can do is if I want to figure out what delta A looks like in order to estimate the uh, backward error, um, I can um, kind of put all these stages together. So um, Okay, so B is um, right. well, I have this L bar plus delta L bar, and then I have this, which, but that is equal to this. So I'm replacing Y plus delta Y with what's on the opposite side here. So that's exactly equal to B. But now what I can do is 
multiply this out. Um, I'm going to leave the x plus. Oh, hold on. That should be x. And I'm just going to multiply out the first two parts. And then L bar U bar, well, I have that up here. So that's A plus E. delta A from over there. So now I have a more concrete expression for my, basically my backward error in A. Um, so how a round off error analysis of Gaussian elimination proceeds is we try to think, get a handle on how big each of these pieces can be and that lets us estimate how big the perturbation in A is. <laughs> Here's where I gloss over some things. Um, but again, I just want to hit the essential points. Okay. So it turns out that um, from Gaussian elimination, um, now this notation here I'm using. Um, Wise bound. So this E is a matrix, so we have we found each of its entries. Um, we can say that's uh, bounded by um, 1 plus L G. I'll explain all these symbols in a moment. Um, Um, now, what do all these things mean? L is a maximum of all the multipliers used in Gaussian elimination. A little later, hopefully I get to it today, I'll cover, well, actually what I'm supposed to cover today, is pivoting. Um, and here we'll actually be able to come up with a bound for this. Because right now, ordinary Gaussian elimination, we have no idea how big these things can be. They could be arbitrarily big, and that's a problem. Um, okay. Uh, little a is just the maximum size of all the entries of your original matrix A. Um, and then u is the round off error. Um, when I cover floating point arithmetic, um, it's, it's a, basically the smallest um, number you can add to 1 and still get something greater than 1 in the floating point system. So it's roughly in IEEE, roughly 10 to the minus 16. Um, and then G is the most mysterious of these things. It's called the growth factor. And that is defined as um, when you finish Gaussian elimination, um, it's 
measure of how much the entries of a matrix grow as you perform Gaussian elimination. Um, so how big are the entries of U, which is your output, your upper triangular matrix, compared to the size of the entries of your original? Um, the trouble is we don't really have a good handle on how large the growth factor is. Um, well, it depends on how you handle row interchanges, uh, things like that. So I'll, I'll have more to say about the size of the growth factor later on when we cover row interchanges. But the point is there is a growth factor, and we have to take it into account. Um, so all of these things influence how erroneous the entries of your L and U are um, when you're carrying out Gauss elimination. OK. Um, now, I guess that's, so we have that. Now we have many other pieces in our error formula. I need to bound those too. Um, so for one thing, the largest entry in our error in L, um, so that is bounded by n times a roundup error times the size of the largest multiplier. Um, and then the error in, so this is the, so think of this as the error incurred during forward substitution. The backward error incurred during back substitution is bounded by n times round up error times the growth factor times the size of the entries of A. Um, now the reason for the um, n in each of these is uh, when you're performing forward or back substitution, you have expressions that have up to you know, around n terms in them, you know, n floating point operations going on. So that it allows up to n floating point errors to accumulate um, in computing any of the unknowns. Okay. So we see the larger the matrix, the worse it gets. OK. So now, between these bounds and bounds on this, uh, the entries of uh, the matrices to begin with, I can put all that together to come up with a bound for, um, for the entries of, of delta A. Okay, so, so referring to this, I need to compute, I need to bound all these expressions, add them all together. So, so maximum of the entries of delta A are bounded by, um, so I have these four pieces. Second piece is delta L bar times U bar. Then I have L bar, delta U bar. Um, these are all IJ. It's the IJ entry of a product. And then finally, delta L bar, delta U bar. Um, so now I can start filling in what I know about these pieces and hopefully it agrees with both of my notes. <clears throat> okay, well EIJ, we have that bound over there. So that's 1 plus L G A U N. Okay, now for the second piece, we have a bound on delta L its entries over there. And then um, for uh, U, the bound on its entries are, um, uh, 
it would be the growth factor G times uh, A. So I have, so for this piece, I have G times A. For this piece, I have, over there, M U L. So you might think, okay, I can just multiply those together. Well, that's not quite it, because this is a matrix matrix product. Anytime you're multiplying two matrices, in each entry you have n terms. So you have to add, you have to include another factor of n. So it's actually n squared u l g a uh, for that piece. Yeah. Uh, u i j, but uh, why you exclude n u? Oh. Um, no, this is different. This this delta u, as opposed to plain u. Um, so I'll, I'll fill in the inner bounds I'm using. Right, so this is bounded by um, G A, and then for L, that's bounded by little L. All right, so. All of those would be enough to put together the rest of these. So, for instance, for L times delta U, um, I'm going to get M squared U L. Same thing, it turns out. So I get two of those terms. Um, okay. And finally, uh, over here, well, both of these include round off error. So I'm going to get something like this order u squared, really small. So I'm going to neglect it. Um, so, so now what I could do is I can put <coughs> lots of, um, all of these things uh, together um, and come up with a bound on the infinity norm of delta A. So what I'm going to get is I need to add all these things together, and they all have a um, GAU, at least, in common. Um, okay. And they also have at least one factor of N. But I have to add another factor of N from here to here, because here we have a bound on each entry. This is infinity norm. How do you compute the infinity norm of a matrix? Maximum. Sum. Yes. What sum? Summing what? Yeah, as opposed to a vector. Yeah, because vectors is the maximum element. Right. But for a matrix. Oh, that's right. Okay. Because I was about to give you the definition of the pseudo, but then I was like, yeah. that's not right. Okay. I mean, I want to say the bad matrix, but I'm not 100 uh, That's a trace. Yeah. I'm not sure what I I don't know. I can give you the pseudo on the Okay. Oh, well, uh, that's what I get for not putting in the homework, I guess. Um, so again, I wasn't planning to do this today anyway. Um, it's the largest row sum. Um, yeah. So, but that's, you're summing up n entries. So we put another factor of n. Um, and then we just have everything else here. So we have uh, L plus 1 plus, again, uh, 2, but I have another factor of n. M, L, okay, yeah, and then there's other terms that are uh, negligible. Okay, um, so, um, so in other words, solving A equals B by computer, the solution that that lab or whatever will, will, or whatever software will spit out at you. It's the exact solution to what we say is a nearby problem. How near is it? This. But that could still be pretty big, unfortunately.
especially if a matrix is large, if n is large, if your growth factor is large, what you're hoping for is that this u, this round off error, will be so small compared to everything else, it'll overwhelm everything, um, or maybe underwhelm everything, so that the whole expression is still pretty small. But we see that there are many things that could influence um, that. But finding a bound on delta A is not the end game. We want a bound on the error in X. Um, so now, so this is a part that I actually wanted to get to, but in order to do this, I needed to um, cover the other stuff. Okay. Oh, whoops. All right. Um, so now for bounding the error in the solution, x hat, which is expressed as x plus delta x. So it's really delta x that we want to try to get a handle on. Okay. So um, All right, so x hat is a plus delta a inverse b. Um, since x hat is the exact solution of our nearby problem. Um, so, um, so delta x, our error, is going to be x hat minus the exact solution. So that's going to be a plus delta A inverse B minus A inverse B, which is the exact solution. Um, so now what I can do is I'm going to um, rewrite this. I want to factor out an A to the left. So that's a times identity plus A inverse times delta A. Um, and the reason why I want to factor out to the left is so that I can say A plus delta A inverse is, because the inverse of a product is a product of the inverses in reverse order. So I have I plus A inverse delta A inverse times a inverse. So this lets me factor out an A inverse B to the right. Um, okay. So, um, all right, so now I can continue um, with this. So what I have is, okay, so I'm going to have I plus A inverse delta A inverse um, A inverse B minus A inverse B. Um, and then Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out, because even though this, I, this whole mess, I plus all this inverse, is only in the first term, I'm going to factor out of the whole thing. So then what's left is going to be A inverse. And then I'm going to factor out of B to the right. And then because I factored this out of this term also, I have to put its inverse back in. So I put this in without the inverse. OK. Um, and uh, what that allows me to do is cancel some things. Um, so if I distribute the A inverse through here, I have this A inverse, and then that's going to cancel. So now all I have left
is minus A inverse delta A, A inverse. All right. So this lets me express the error in X in such a way that by taking norms, I can use properties of norms to try to get a upper bound um, on all this. Now, um, Okay. Now, for sake of this analysis, I'm going to make this assumption here that. Um, okay. And find R to be the norm, whatever norm I'm using, of A inverse times delta A. Um, and I'm going to assume that this norm is uh, less than 1. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to call this, label this as minus f. So what that means is, uh, as a result of this, um, the norm of identity plus a inverse delta a, which is the same as the norm of identity minus f, um, okay, actually is less than or equal to 1 over 1 minus r. This, this is from some time ago. I did an analysis after covering norms um, that um, if you're making a small perturbation of identity, how it affects the um, norm of the inverse. Um, so now what I can do is, what I, uh, with that to begin with, so the norm of the error relative to the norm of x, this is relative error we care about. Um, so that would be, so using my expression over there, that is the norm of identity plus A inverse delta A inverse times Minus A inverse delta A, A inverse times B, all over norm of X. Um, but now using the um, uh, properties of norms, that the norm of product is less than or equal to the product of the norms, so this is less than or equal to, so I have the norm of this, which is less than or equal to 1 over 1 minus r. Then I have the um, norm of A inverse from here. And then I have the norm of uh, delta A. And then A inverse B, that's the norm of x. But I also have the norm of x down below. So those cancel. Um, and then, um, as for the uh, delta A, okay. um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply and divide by uh, norm of A. Um, so what that gives me is I can put norm of A inverse and norm of A together and get the condition number of A. And then what I have left is 
norm of delta A over norm of A. So in other words, the relative perturbation in A that it results from the accumulation of uh, round-off error. Um, so that change in A is, is um, uh, amplified by the condition number. So after all the things that can make delta A large to begin with, the size of a matrix, the growth factor, um, the both those things, then if, it's, if on top of that A is also ill-conditioned, this error bound is amplified even more. So in other words, a lot of things can go wrong with Gauss limitation. Um, uh, so, um, and I think that's one reason why people 50 years ago had some serious doubts about it. Um, but if you use it wisely and you handle rotor changes correctly, then it's still a viable process, and that's why people are actually using it. Okay. Um, now, um, in the notes, I manipulate this a little further, like with the 1 over 1 minus r factor, but I'm not going to bother um, with that. Um, so here, I only assumed that A was perturbed by round up error. I assumed that B was exact. But if B was not exact, I get something similar to this, except there'd also be uh, an extra term involving the relative change in uh, relative uh, perturbation in B. All right. Um, so, uh, so the thing is, this expression, delta A, that's of order u, to use a round up error. So what matters is not just is A ill-conditioned or not. What really matters is how large is the condition number relative to the round up error. So, if um, uh, suppose the condition number is 10 to the 10. So if you're using um, uh, regular double precision floating point arithmetic, where you use 10 to the minus 16, and on top of that, A is a large matrix, so you get powers of N to deal with, then your solution is not going to be very accurate. But if you're using like extended precision, so maybe your U is like 10 to the minus 50, um, then using the same matrix, um, you're going to be okay. You're going to get a nice, accurate solution. So it all depends how much precision you have available and the conditioning of the uh, uh, matrix. Okay. So any questions about this test? All right. Now, um, so the thing to focus on now is uh, there are a couple of variables in here. There's this variable G, the growth factor. We want to keep that in check. And also, a little l, the size of the multipliers. If that's big, again, we have a problem, even if everything else is OK. Um, so we need to look at um, uh, okay. um, uh, pivoting. So at least we can make things a little more manageable. Okay. So we already know that there's going to be times where row interchanging is necessary. I mean, you saw that in your linear algebra class. If you got a situation where you couldn't perform any of a row operation because you'd be dividing by zero, all you would have to do is interchange rows, and then you could continue. And um, in, when you're doing this on paper, that's the only time you would ever interchange rows, is if you absolutely had to, to avoid dividing by zero. But that's not the case in the numerical linear algebra world. Um, and here's why. So if you look at the main step of Gaussian elimination, so we're Transitioning from matrix A K to or A J to A J plus one by eliminating subdiagonal entries in in column J. 
So if I write out the main step in Gaussian elimination, the limited entries in col column J, you have this multiplier Mij, and you multiply that by some entry in row J, column K, and then you subtract that from the entry in the same column K, but row I. And then the result of that is stored in the same place, but we call that a j plus 1. Now, we have to assume that every entity in here has some round off error in it. Um, so, but here's the problem. This entry um, is a result of pre working on previous columns. So this has some round off error. That round off error is amplified by this multiplier here. So it's in our interest to avoid having large multipliers uh, in order to try to rein in the round off error that's accumulating during Gaussian elimination. And fortunately, that's pretty easy to do. Because when we're doing this on paper, you don't want to do row interchanges. You ever sounds tedious enough. You want to do as few operations as possible. But if a computer is doing all the work, and it's doing it erroneously, then you can go ahead and make it do more row interchanges. Um, so you use pivoting, which is just another term for row interchanges. To limit the size of your multipliers. Um, there's, there's many pivoting strategies out there. I'm just going to focus on a couple. The most commonly used is partial pivoting. Um, so what you do is um, at, uh, at each, for, before you start working on each column, So before you're eliminating any entries in column J, you swap row J with row P, where P has to be greater than or equal to J, where The size of that entry in row P in the same column is equal to the maximum over all entries in that part of the column, from the diagonal all the way down. Okay. So in the part of the column of interest, from the diagonal to the bottom, you find the largest entry in absolute value, and you swap to move that entry to the diagonal position. And the reason why is, look at your, how you compute your multipliers. Mij is Aij over Ajj. So if I look at the absolute value of my multipliers, actually I'm going to fill in a superscript J to indicate we're not working on the original matrix. We're working on the matrix after we've already gone through the previous columns. So By doing this row interchanging, how large, what's the largest the multiplier can possibly be? Okay, so I'm looking at a certain portion of a column, 
I'm finding a largest entry in here and I'm moving to the diagonal position. So once I do that, what happens to the size of, of these? Wouldn't AIJ be less than AJK? Yes. So then, so then what's one? one? Yeah. So, and that's the largest multiplier it could possibly be. Um, so we don't get amplification of whatever round off error is in here at all. Um, in fact, it may be reduced a little bit, uh, preferably. Okay. Um, now, the thing to keep in mind, though, is. Um, would you still switch it if it, like, you had less than or equal to one? Like, what would be the point of switching it if it's equal to one? Um, well, that's still the worst case. Um, so, I mean, you would go to partial pivoting if it. Uh, well, okay. Are you asking about, okay, you. You're searching and then there's... There's two that are like... Oh, yeah. If, if, like a, if AJK and AIJ are the same... Um, yeah, if, if, if there's a tie, you can pick any one. Um, and yeah, but, but, yeah, but you can get multipliers that are one. It, it's just coincidence that that happens. <clears throat> okay. Um... Now, even though there's no computation performed to do this, there's still work being done because you're doing a comparison. So, um, so doing all this costs order n squared comparisons. So we can't ignore that in terms of judging efficiency. However, order because you're doing you know nearly you know, n comparisons in the first column and n minus 1 in the second and so forth, but it adds up to order n squared. Um, but gas elimination in general costs two-thirds n cubed floating point operations, so it's still far greater than the overhead of, of this. So it's worthwhile uh, what you gain from reducing the accumulation of round up error to do this relatively little extra work um, to uh, make that happen. Um, now, what this means is um, we can uh, now we, in this case we can quantify the uh, growth factor. So, so as a result of this, uh, okay, so little l from the round off error analysis is one, the bound of the multipliers, and then g, the growth factor, is two to the n minus one. So it's still bad. Um, so there are certain <coughs> pathological cases where you still get a lot of accumulation of round up error. Uh, you can construct a matrix for which you actually get that growth factor of 2 to the n minus 1. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say, say that could occur in, in nature. But, um, but the point is, theoretically, uh, significant growth in the entries of u is still possible. OK, so that's one pivoting strategy. And then the other one um, takes things a step further. And that is called complete pivot. So what happens in complete pivoting is um, you find indices P and Q, uh, both greater or equal to J, um, so that the size of this entry is equal to the maximum
Okay, typo in the notes, I'll fix it here. Um, so, I need you to draw it. So I'm working in column J, and I want an entry in AJJ that's going to give me the best advantage when it comes to multipliers. So I'm going to search not just, okay, so this column, this part is what I would search in partial pivoting. Complete pivoting, I search this whole region of the matrix. Um, so I uh, find somewhere entry A, P, Q that is the largest in this whole sea of entries, and I swap uh, rows and columns uh, to put this entry in the JJ position. Um, so once you find this entry, well, if you find um, the entries P and Q, you swap row J and P, and rows, and then you swap columns J and Q. Okay. So that has so you um, so in that case your multipliers for this column, uh, depending on where this entry is, could conceivably be, be bounded uh, even less than one. Um, so you gain something there, um, but you're doing more comparisons. So it's order and Q comparisons. So now that, that's, that's much more significant. Um, what do you gain from that? It reduces the growth factor. Now, unfortunately, we don't really know what the growth factor is. and It's not exponential like it was before partial pivoting. Um, it's a matter of conjecture. Like, it was conjectured that the growth factor in this case is uh, bounded by n, but that's not true. Uh, they found a counterexample. Um, OK. So, but at least we can say that the entries of u do not grow exponentially compared to uh, the entries of a. Um, so more overhead, but the numerical stability of Gauss elimination is greater with complete pivoting than with partial. Still, like in like real software, like in MATLAB, partial pivoting is still generally what's used. <coughs> Um, well, what you could do is the, the error estimate with complete pivoting would be less just because that error estimate is related to the growth factor and now that is smaller. What is the growth factor? We, we don't know. Um, unless someone's proved it lately. Okay, so now that we have pivoting, using some form of pivoting, um, and for the rest of the discussion, I'll just assume partial pivoting so that we're only interchanging rows, not columns. How does this affect the, um, the whole process of uh, solving AX equals B? So there's some slight changes there. I'm not going to use that. Um, instead, it's more instructive to look at uh, the algorithm. So I'm going to recall what the algorithm was. I'm going to take necessary changes to competitivity. Right here, 
we swap rho j with rho p such that a p j is equal to the maximum, Um, but here's the important wrinkle, because keep in mind, at this point, chances are we've already made some eliminations in previous columns. And what are we storing in those columns? We're storing multipliers now, because those are the entries that are being zero. But as I mentioned before, for LE factorization, we stuff the multipliers in that lower triangular part as we eliminate. So here's the important thing. When you do a row swap, you might think, oh, well, we're working on the matrix from column J forward. We only need to swap those. But actually, it's not true. You swap the entire rows, including whatever multipliers might be in them. Um, because um, if you're doing a row interchange, um, that part, like where was what, what, what row, because those were multipliers corresponding to certain rows. If the rows are moved, the multipliers need to move with them. Um, so, if it's, so, it's, so it's very easy to take care of in code, just swap the whole thing and everything will work out beautifully. And that makes for a much simpler process that I can now describe for solving the x equals b. So, um, so instead of doing A equal to LU, you have PA equal to LU, where P is a matrix that performs all of the, um, that's weird, why am I? Oh, okay. Um, where P is called a permutation matrix. And the way you get the permutation matrix is you, whatever row interchanges you needed to do, you apply them to the identity matrix. Um, so as an example, um, if I have a matrix like this, the three by three, all I've done here is you swap rows two and three. So you multiply that matrix on the left with A, it'll swap rows two and three of uh, A. Um, by the way, a um, permutation matrix is an orthogonal matrix. Uh, so B transpose P's identity. Um, so, so the nice thing is, even though you're coming up with these row interchanges in the middle of a process, like you swap and eliminate some entries, then you swap again and eliminate some entries, that is equivalent to if you just did all the row interchanges up front. When you can't do it because you don't know them until you work your way through it. But it's almost as if you did because you interchange the multipliers too. So as long as you do that, then this works. Um, so now, for the next step, you have, uh, before you had back forward substitution, Ly is equal to B. The only change is now you do Ly is equal to PB. Because you're taking A equals B, and you multiply both sides by P. That's why you need to do this. Um, and finally, um, same back substitution step. Uh, no change there. Um, Oh, and I should mention, because I uh, last time I talked about the determinants. Um, so that's influence 
little bit of uh, pivoting because when you swap two rows of a matrix, does anyone remember what that does to the determinant? Yeah, and it gains it. So the determinant of A, before it was just a determinant of U. But now we just take into account the negation. So minus 1 to the S power, where S is equal to the number of row interchanges you needed to perform. Okay. Um, so it's still pretty easy to uh, get determined once you perform gas elimination, pivoting or not. Um, if you were doing complete pivoting, it would be number of row swaps and columns uh, swaps. Uh, because either kind is going to change the uh, sign of the determinant. Okay. Right, yeah, so, so it's the first reason that, um, well, actually because it's orthogonal, but that um, permutation matrices always have a determinant of uh, plus or minus one. Um, but any permutation can be written as a combination of transpositions. Each transposition uh, causes that negation. Okay, so any questions about pivoting and how that influences Gaussian elimination? Um, all right. I still have, okay. Um, so reference to one thing that's a little bit erroneous in the notes. Um, okay. So I want to address that because what happens um, when you're doing partial pivoting? So you start with your A, and then you perform some permutation matrix to swap to, before eliminating entries in the first column. That's the first thing that happens. And then you do your um, other row operations where you're subtracting multiples of rows from other rows. Um, and then you possibly swap again in the second column, and you just keep going um, all the way out to okay. Um, and the result of that is your upper triangle matrix U. But the thing is, this doesn't look anything like. Uh, Something will lead to PA equals LU because in PA equals LU, we have all the permutations together up front. And here, you don't have that. They're interspersed. So, um, so, so, what, so what can you do? Um, so what I'll do here is I'm going to insert um, the second permutation, but... I need to compensate for that by putting its transpose. Okay. Um, so now I can write this as u is equal to a, and then I have p1, first row interchange, p2, and now I have this next matrix m p2. M1, P2 transpose. So I group those together. And after that, I have um, okay, M2 and so forth. Okay. So now we'll take a look at this. So what we have here, this is a... Um, here we, the M is a unit lower triangular matrix, and then we have permutation matrices on the, both sides. This one is swapping rows, and this one is um, swapping columns. 
Um, now, M1, as we've seen this before, it's structured like this. We have identity, and then we have all of these um, negative multipliers. And in this case, they're in the first column. Now, what about P2? P2's job is to swap row 2 with some row down below it. So first row is going to be identity again. And then row 2 is going to be somewhere down here. And then um, some other row is going to be up here, like I'll call it this one. And then we have otherwise identity. So we have a, a row swap happening by multiplying in the left, and then the same swap in terms of columns happening on the uh, right. Well, the effect that this has is it's going to rearrange two of these multipliers. And they're still going to be here in the first column, just in a different order. Everything else, because we're swapping rows and columns, doesn't get moved. All these other entries, the ones along the diagonal, they're still going to be in the diagonal. Um, so, what ends up happening is, and this is what is erroneous in the notes, you actually have u is equal to a, and then you have p1, p2, up to pn minus 1, and then you have different m's. Um, M1 tilde, M2 tilde, where each of these new M's is one of the previous M's with some rows interchanged. Um, well, actually, only multipliers interchanged, not the entire row. Okay, so this right here makes L inverse. This right here is P. Um, so, uh, so by adjusting the order of the multipliers in the appropriate column, um, that's how we can rearrange it so that all the row interchanges happen up front, and we get that PA equals LU thing going. I just wanted to take a moment to show you where that comes from. And wow, I'm exactly out of time right now. Okay, so I'll pick up with... I'm, I'm slightly behind, but it's not really a big deal. Oh, um... Next week, no class at all, because Tuesday's monogram break, and Thursday, I'm coming back from a conference, but I will not be back in time for class. So we'll still have class this Thursday, but not next week.